so welcome back everybody uh, so welcome back everybody for the final day of lectures uh, although the tutorials are going to be uh, over the weekend uh, so uh, uh, this is uh, simon's final lecture so over to you simon okay uh, hello everyone let me share my screen yes so so yeah so this is a well list of reference that uh, will appear during this talk they will be placed uh, more uh, judiciously after the lecture is done but uh, but today yeah i want to describe uh, i will spend roughly half the lectures after lecture describing uh, uh, the basic an important mathematical tool. It's, it sounds like a very technical thing about linear. It's linear programming. It's a basic tool that underlies the bootstrap. But I would like to I would like to spend some time on it, just because it's a it's a tool that's useful if you can learn it. Uh, and then I will spend some time. I will not try to have a grand uh, plan or grand summary of what uh, are uh, interesting open problems to to work on, but. I mean, I would mention some open problems during the talk, and I would try to mention some things that seem to have worked or seem to be making progress recently. So I will, that's the, the, the way we'll try to present things once these uh, recent papers that will be uh, spilled over. So the place where we were last time is, uh, so we studied these, these uh, dispersion relations which come from an entity of scattering amplitude. And we look at contour like this. And the idea was to relate some UV physics to some uh, EFT physics at the scale M. Okay. I want to calculate an ellipticity and which come from causality relates high energies and low energies. And we want to exploit that. Uh, in the case of a scalar effective field theory, if the uh, low energy Lagrangian had some sort of, sorry, if the low energy uh, scattering amplitude contained terms like sum of contact interaction, the following type, and then G3, STU, plus the data, we're not going to list uh, more than that for today, we found last time that we can express uh, these uh, these uh, observables in the EFT in terms of averages of couplings to heavy states. So the simplest average was something like G2, the one over M4, and G3 equal something like three minus two J, j plus one rem six these things are really straightforward to calculate just by expanding uh, the gender polynomials in around forward limit so there's an actually an exercise about that and it's this detailed in the uh, in the uh, paper so part of what i'm describing here for the first part of the talk i'll be following closely uh, this paper from a year ago And, and the interesting thing is that sometimes you can calculate some, uh, there's some crossing relation that tells you that some things have to be, some average over every coupling have to be zero. So for example, this particular average. Or to the end. Okay. And these averages, they, by definition, just sum overall heavy states, meaning all even spin and some integral from the cutoff to infinity of the mass and times the imaginary part of the amplitude times whatever you want to average. The only important thing we're going to need there is that this is positive. So this is all the anatomy. If we abstract this, so we're going to abstract this and stare at this as a mathematical problem and see how, how we solve this kind of problem for the next half hour or so. So abstractly, what this is, is it has all the anatomy of a bootstrap problem. 
that we sketched in the first uh, lecture. So the three ingredients effectively is that we have a bunch of unknowns, like these things, we don't know anything. They are about UV physics, we're completely agnostic about what they are, but they are positive. So we have positive unknowns. Uh, the sum observable we'd like to maximize. So for example, the problem we posed last time was to the question we ask, uh, yeah, given G2, what is the what is the minimum of the next coupling, the next aerodiversive correction? So if you measure one of them, what can you say about the size of the next one? So so the something we like to uh, some observable observable we'd like to maximize or minimize. And the final ingredient is we have some kind of crossing equation. And these things are also what we get in the conformal bootstrap. We didn't talk about conformal symmetry at all in these lectures, but uh, in this case, the positive unknowns will be the, uh, the CFT. Possible unknown would be the OP coefficient square that appear in the OPE. The uh, sum observable to maximize could be either the scaling dimension or something. Usually, you will maximize the. You could also. Well, the thing that's more analogous to what we do now is maximize some coupling. Uh, you know, maximize something like uh, for some particular operator you care most about. You could also. There's a there's a method to that produce exclusion plots on scaling dimensions, which is what people most often care about in CFTs, by that called the navigator function that works by introducing some extra spurious operator and minimizing the amount of coefficient you need. And if you don't need them, then the theory is, is not excluded. So there's some, you can cast almost all problems in bootstrap in terms of some extremization, maximization of something. And for the conformal bootstrap, well, the crossing equation would be in fact, that's sum over OP, OP coefficient square times block difference in blocks in different channels is equal to zero. And for us, well, I set up a problem here. We will just have one crossing equation. Later, we'll add more. But let's study this baby problem. We have one thing we fix, one thing we try to extremize, and one crossing equation. So we have all the ingredients, and, and the unknowns are positive. So that's what we try to do. The last time we saw that uh, sometimes you can prove uh, some, you can use some ad hoc Cauchy-Schwarz type bound, and and this in this problem here, it's relatively easy uh, to 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 use. So so we actually did it uh, at the end of last time. So we can prove a bound on dg plus one over m six. So ad hoc. Cauchy Schwartz you can prove things along the line that the average of j, j plus one, or m6 is less than eight or m4 times, uh, so eight over m square times g2. You can prove things like this, and that just follows from roughly the fact that this crossing equation prevents states of spin large to be from contributing too much because it's balanced small spins against large spins. So, so we can prove things like this. And if you plug that uh, back into this, you would get a bound on G3 that gives, so we'll just plug this eight times the two, I get the minus 16. So it has to be greater than or equal to minus 16 uh, G2. And I'm going to multiply it this time score on the left. So I'm comparing two things which have the same units and that's really the, the, the yeah. so if I work in units with the cutoff is equal to one, then that's really comparable. And okay, there's a number of other strategy that we discussed last time. We're going to discuss the simple linear programming strategy. So the, the more systematic strategy.
So what do we do? So the idea is to consider arbitrary linear combinations of all the equations we have. And then if we can try, if we can find linear combinations that are positive on all unknowns, then we learn something. That's the idea. We try to find linear combinations of all the equations we have that have the same sign on all unknowns. So we're going to take linear combination of the right hand sides. So So linear combination here, I'm going to take the quotient of the second one, G3 to be one, because that's the thing I'm most interested in, in minimizing. So I have something like alpha times one over M4 plus this guy here. Plus beta times the next guy. We take linear combination, call this a functional acting on the AV state with spin J and mass M. And if we can find linear combination such that this is positive for all possible AV states, we don't know where the AV states are, we don't know where the spectrum is, but we know that the, the spins can be an even integer, and we know that the mass can be above m. So that means uh, yeah, j greater than 0, then, and m greater than the EFT cutoff. If you can find a linear combination of these functionals, which satisfy this positivity condition, then uh, any such linear combination proves an inequality that, uh, well, then the fact that the measure is positive, the fact that if the m is positive implies that the left hand side of this sum rules here will be positive. So alpha times G2. Plus G3 plus beta times zero is positive. And, and that's an inequality on G3, equivalently, right? G3 is greater than minus alpha G2. And here, when you implement this in practice, you make everything to have the same uh, units by multiplying by appropriate powers of the cutoff so that you're looking for coefficients alpha and beta that are unitless. So, let's put, uh, same squared G2. so if you find, if you have alphas and beta such that you have this positivity condition is satisfied on all AV states, then you prove this inequality. And then of course, you're gonna be interested in the optimal of such inequality. We're trying to maximize minus alpha over uh, such positive function. So that's the kind of mathematical problem we have to solve. The good news is that the algorithms to solve that. To numerically solve, to numerically solve such problem. And it's, it's algorithms we don't necessarily learn in, the, in, 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 in our undergrad or grad school. We, if you don't work in this business, you never learn this algorithm because it's not like mo most of what computers do is linear algebra, but it's just like linear algebra with inequalities instead of equalities. It's, uh, you have to take linear combination of equation 
such that all the coefficients end up positive. It's not a standard linear algebra problem, but for some reason it's still called linear programming. But, uh, so one method is, uh, well, to put this on the computer, well, what you have to do is you have to discretize, of course. You, you, can't, you cannot impose positivity at all spins and mass uh, in one go. It's not easy. Uh, for, from the computer, so, so the first strategy is simply discretize. So, so you sample a bunch of spins and M, try to have a fine grid, sample on the, on the fine grid A of states characterized by the spin and the mass that are above the cutoff. And then you have a list of positivity condition, right? So, so we can get, uh, yeah, so, so we have a, we have a list, uh, can get a list of condition that, so that's a sample, let's say N points on a fine grid of fine grid. So we have N positivity constraints dotted into these three unknowns that are going to have to give a positive numbers, where the zero here is really n vectors of zero. Okay. So, so by discretizing this, you turn this into a problem where you impose that the matrix dotted into some vector, you're trying to look for unknowns such that when dotted into a matrix, you get a positive vector. So this is something that's called a linear program. And Mathematica has a function called linear programming, also a better one that's called linear optimization. Can solve this. Okay, and what you get out of this, and you, you, it's also uh, this, this this routine, as the name suggests, doesn't just find positive combination. It can find combination that optimize a certain purpose, such as having the maximal value of uh, yeah, maximizing this bound, okay? giving you the optimal bound. So, and yeah, the mathematical thing works uh, usually for small problems. Uh, there are some uh, improvements of this. Uh, the, D, the syntax of this thing is uh, you can look at at the end of the uh, assignment. It's, uh, you can actually try this on your own. It's not that hard. So I suggest uh, this partial problem with three functionals. It's actually a very good warm up to, to familiarize yourself with these methods. And who knows, maybe they would be useful for other problems in your research. Very, uh, very cool methods. Uh, sort of another strategy is to, it turns out that you can impose positivity at all mass at once for each spin. Impose for all mass at once for some finite list of spins. So you still have to sample at least in the spin direction, but you can deal with the masses at once. And, and the way to do this uses a very nice theorem. It's a theorem about a real function. Say a polynomial, it's a theorem about polynomial. It says that the polynomial of X is positive for all real X if you can write it as a sum of squares. meaning squares of uh, simple polynomials. And there's a refinement of this is that if you only want positivity for positive X, then the polynomial has to be written as a sum of square plus X times another sum of square. 
So polynomial is positive if only you can write it as sum of square, basically. But if it so so one direction of this uh, statement is obvious. You can write it as sum of square. It's clearly positive, and and the claim that is exhaust positive polynomial. It's kind of a cool result. And and what these results allow you to do is once you write your problem in terms of uh, of polynomials, uh, you can do this by making change of variables like. Uh, one over m square, if you write as x over x plus one, and you multiply by some power of x plus one, you end up with uh, uh, yeah, m greater than one maps to x greater than zero. So you can do appropriate change of variables that, that uh, map this uh, to the standard problem. And what the reason this is useful is that a polynomial is positive Say of, of degree, for example, of degree 2q. Is a sum of square, sorry. If and only if you can write it in the form, the following form. It's kind of a, a trivial restatement. If you can write it in terms of a positive matrix, so you define a vector that's one x x to q, you dot into a matrix, and then you have this vector transpose. Okay. Where M is a positive semi-definite matrix. Okay. So it's obvious that M, if a, yeah, so if M is a positive matrix, then it's a sum, right? So you can diagonalize it to sum of positive eigenvalues. And so it's obvious that this polynomial is a sum of square. So the statement, so, so this theorem allows you to rewrite uh, this constraint on infinitely many X on infinite. So like we try to impose a constraint on all possible real values of X. And, and now it becomes a constraint about a finite dimensional matrix being positive definite. So, so yeah, so, so I'm imposing by finding positive matrix M A positive matrix is a symmetrical matrix with all eigenvalues non uh, non negative. Infinitely many constraints. So for all uh, x greater than for all m greater than n capital m. Okay. However, this. Uh, this business of finding not just numbers that are positive, but matrices that are, that are positive, turns out there's also good algorithms for this. It's called semi-definite programming. And the best tool to solve for that, uh, I think it, 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 it's a great tool, it's very well coded, is called, uh, there's a software that's available called SDPB. So if you get serious into this, it's really worth uh, installing and, and 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 learning to use it. So uh, yeah. So so what you get from these things are optimal bounds on on couplings given a certain number of crossing equations that you input. Uh, once you find a once you found a solution, once you have a functional, you can usually visualize it and confirm that it's positive. Once uh, a numerically positive functional is found, uh, Essentially, it's possible to plot and, 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 and visualize that it's indeed positive. Okay. Positivity 
is easy to verify. So you can always verify the validity. So I'm going to share my screen on a little notebook that just give you a flavor of what this, these things look like when you, when you do them. Uh, yes, yeah. So you have an example here where that's exactly the problem we talked about. So you have the functional that computes G2, G3, but now I have a, a whole bunch of these crossing equations or null constraints. And I asked the computer to find a combination of these things that is always positive. And, and SDPB returned me this particular function, which proves a bound that G3 is greater than minus 10.34 G2 in units of the cutoff scale. The, to verify that it's positive, it's uh, well, one thing you can do naively is just start plotting it for various spins. And if you do that, you find uh, it, that it's very hard to convince yourself that's always positive. But then you realize that there are some patterns and there's a very natural way to plot these things, which is to plot in terms of the impact parameter B. An impact parameter is uh, twice a spin over M. So that's just a kinematic relation. Maybe I can explain it. Uh, bit after, but you can plot in terms of impact parameter, the mass, and then I'm plotting the functional in this 3D plot. And I'm sharing, my, sharing this on Mathematica because 3D plots, I know they're very hard to visualize when you can drag them around. So I will try to slowly drag it. I don't know if you can see something. Uh, yeah. So you see that this structure at the function is B, like this, all the functional at large mass, so the, the behind here is at large mass. All the functions at large mass, they kind of have these zeros at some fixed value of B. The lines, each line represents one value of spin. So this goes to spin 100 or something. What you see, what you see from this is that uh, where is dangerous? So, so we have, so, so yeah, the curves are, we have discrete curves because spin is discrete. And what you see is that, uh, yeah, the dangerous place will be at infinity. You can go along days. Maybe you can uh, won't worry that you go under zero and then there are dangerous places for a first few spins close to the threshold uh, m equal to one here on the, this edge of the plot. But apart from that, you immediately see that everything's fine and, and you easily see that there's no need to explore regions further to the left. Uh, sorry, further to the right of of this plot, right? So, so you you can exhaust. It's a proof by exhaustion. You check every region that that you can uh, worry about, and then to attest yourself that uh, uh, to confirm that there's no issue, if you keep pushing further, you can just plot. You can just take a scaling limit where the impact parameter is fixed, but the mass goes to infinity, and then you find that the function is always positive. You can actually check that it doesn't dip under zero. So, so, so you can, so this, you can basically prove theorems with this method. So I haven't told you generate the function numerically using some discrete approximations. You, the outcome can be confirmed to be valid. So, I'm going to tell you now what this outcome means physically, uh, what this bound mean physically. Oops, uh, should I be sharing something else? Not sharing this. So, so any question about this? Uh, no, I don't see any questions in the chat box. Uh, does anybody have any questions? I'm still taking a two-minute break. <laughs> yeah, a long I, day for me. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It takes a bit of time for people to frame questions. So I think it's a good yeah. idea to pause.
No, so maybe someone I can ask you a question. The, the semi-definite programming, uh, Mathematica cannot do semi-definite programming. You have to use uh, uh, sim, uh, David's uh, uh, necessarily David's code. Uh, I think Mathematica can do some of it, but uh, it's not. Uh, I've never really figured out to do it. <laughs> Uh -huh. yeah. But they, yeah, I, 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 I know that David try a lot, and, and but even even linear programming, Mathematica is not very stable. It, yeah. As soon as you have a problem that becomes uh, slightly large, uh, yeah. Yeah. You, have, you have to you have to put like uh, ten thousand digits of precision, otherwise it crashes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's uh, it's it's not a great uh, yeah. It, it's not. It works for small problems. The Mathematica one works for small problems if you, if you get started, but mm -hmm. if you want to scale it up, you 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 want to use the professional software. Okay, so finally, there's a question. Raghu is asking, uh, how does one prove the statement about a positive polynomial being a sum of squares? Ah, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Uh, it's but uh, if you look up at the paper uh, that David wrote introducing SDPB, it's like, uh, there are reference about this theorem. There's actually something much more general is true. It's a statement. The statement is true about. Uh, uh, it's a statement that's true about polynomial matrices. A polynomial matrix is positive if only if you can write it as a sum of uh, uh, squares in a certain sense. So it's what is true is actually much more general than what I wrote. It's it's proven in that paper. Well, the paper give a reference to where it's proven. Uh, any other questions? Okay, I, I think we can continue. Okay, so I will I will say a few things about uh, what uh, these uh, bounds uh, look like that you get. So, so yeah, again, so this is uh, stuff from mostly this uh, this paper. Uh, so, so as we're saying, you get uh, lower bound and upper bound on on dimensionless ratios, and these ratios are basically uh, the G three is something with a six derivative, and the tilde means here I'm dividing by G two. So the leading one has to be positive. So it's natural to divide by it. And, and what we see is that if you set G2 to zero, everything else has to go to zero uniformly. And, and you have dimension, all these dimensionless ratios by newness of the cutoff scale, they're bounded, they have two-sided bounds. So and the, the thing which is uh, kind of physically interesting about these bounds is that uh, they don't grow with the derivative order. So they basically respect uh, uh, the, the idea you might have from just a geometric series. So higher derivative couplings don't Grow faster than you think for propagator than than geometric maybe. And what you would have for like if you integrate out like there's a naive idea that if you integrate out a heavy particle, you get a series in you get a series in one over mass square with terms that are coefficients that are one basically. And, and these bounds basically reflect that. But this thing which is sort of interesting and non-trivial is that this is true even if the UV theory is strongly coupled. So we're completely agnostic about what happens in the UV. So it doesn't have to look, the actual thing we do doesn't have to be just like integrating out a particle. And, but still, yeah, and, and, and yeah, even the theory is UV is strongly coupled and has states of all spins. Okay, so this applies, for example, to string theory or to 
presumably the UV completion of, of, of quantum gravity. So, so this is very generic. We just assume causality and, and we get uh, this. So it's kind of curious in some sense, uh, when we started doing this, this, this project and, and for a while, the, the, the message was that we should look for the message in this somehow, uh, uh, it was kind of a swampland type idea that uh, uh, in the space of effective theories, we should look for effective field theories that are causal. And then what we're seeing is that it, it's kind of redundant saying that if you're looking for causal theories, you will naturally discover things with EFT power counting. So it's kind of a surprising, uh, well, surprising to me and it, it, surprising that causality is so strong. So causality implies the existence of an EFT-like power counting. So I don't know what to do with that, but that that that's a fact. And then you can do uh, you can uh, you can do more fancy things where you fix one coupling and or two, G two and G two and and try to look at the third one, you get a nice exclusion plots. Uh, and you can also ask how it converge when you add the uh, null constraints. So the outer curve here is the simplest thing you will have. Uh, and uh, yeah, when you add a few. In contrast, the thing you would prove by Cauchy-Schwartz was like minus 16, so it's like relatively far out. But, uh, but adding null constraints, it, it converge rather fast. So, so in practice, these sort of problems don't require, well, at least for the scalar case, don't require a lot of, of computer power. Uh, and another thing you can do that's more conceptual that I will describe now is that, well, you can ask, what are the costs? Yeah, so there's a question in the chat. Yeah, why did the yeah. plot for the uh, functional have kinks for at fixed B for all Js? Uh, I think it's largely an, an artifact of, of the metal. I, I, I don't think the zeros of this, uh, I mean, there were, were kinks on the uh, on the log plot, but they're, they're really just zeros. Uh, the zeros of the functional, they, they, I don't think they're physical, but they appear mechanically because, uh, when you take the scaling limit at large mass and fixed impact parameter, you get polynomial. And if you have a if you have a this is just a feature about uh, optimization problem. So if you if you impose, for example, that a uh, if you search in a space of function of polynomial that are and the acts that are positive above some value, your code will return you functions that are positive above the value, but usually they will have a zero there and and become negative outside where you don't ask them to be positive. And the other thing that happens is they will have double zero very often in the middle of the region. So it, it, it's very generic that this extremization problem gives you uh, double zeros in the middle of the regions. So I, I don't think there's anything deep with these things. Are the upper bounds on G tilde actually rational? They look nicer. Yeah, most of, many of them are rational. Uh, some of these are the most of these on the left are not rational. The upper bounds are all rational. Yeah, uh, there's a simple reason why the upper bounds are rational. We'll come to this in a, in a second. Yeah. Ah, great. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Loga has a question. I will address it. I will discuss this in a, in a few minutes. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So I had a few words here about. Uh, ruling in, maybe let, let, me, let me make a broader discussion here. So, so there's always two dual approaches to the bootstrap. Uh, okay. You can try to rule out theory, or you can try to rule in theory, meaning that yeah, I don't mean rule in in a, like a very top-down scenario where you try to embed them in string theory and have a UV completion and so on, but just find uh, that means, uh, for example, you can exhibit some uh, 222S matrix that satisfy all our axioms. Okay. 
And by definition, that's something you'll never be able to rule out with this method. Okay. And there are nice ways to uh, to uh, to construct systematically study such uh, such theory. I've been discussed in some of the, uh, the paper here. I should refer to well, I'm lost. Okay, sorry. I will I will stop trying to look for reference. Ah, I found them here. Yeah, this is a nice paper here. Discuss uh, discuss this a bit, but. Uh, the relation between this primal and dual problem. It's a, it's a general thing about optimization problem that, uh, that ideally, like you would like, let me put it like this. When you make this exclusion plot here and using this constraint that we talk about, we, we heat up the space from the outside, but you can also try to populate it from the inside. And, uh, the idea is that if these two approaches converge, then you know you have the optimal space as far as the axioms are concerned. Okay, and in this case, we can actually we can actually almost do it for this problem. It turns out that uh, there are two theories you can write down that have positive partial wave expansions and have only states above the cutoff M. That's uh, two examples of those. Well, the first one is clearly kind of exchange of a bunch of spin zero particles. It's a theory. <laughs> the last one doesn't look like a very sensible theory. <laughs> you cannot get that from a Feynman diagram. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't look sensible at all, but as far as what we impose go, this uh, as a positive partial waves, as uh, yeah, satisfies all our axioms. Maybe there's some more axioms we should impose that will exclude this thing. If you can find that, it would be great. And and these two theories are the two cusps at the, uh, in the exclusion plot. If I scroll back up here, these two points are these two theories. And if you scale up the mass parameter in this theory on the right, you end up with uh, this exactly this line. If you scale the mass parameter on the left, you end up with this line. And if you take linear combination of these theories, that's also allowed because our constraints are linear, you fill in this outside. Okay. So, so just by writing down these two theories, we ruled in this whole region. And then, okay, there's some little extra wedge here that we haven't ruled in, but essentially uh, that's where we are. Uh, that explains, that's answered the question, why are all these, all these upper bounds look so simple? It's because the upper bounds are saturated by this uh, simple theory that's just exchange of spin zero particle, heavy spin zero particles. So the upper bounds are all very trivial, but the lower bound, they're a bit more messy because sometimes they involve not this point, but they involve this, uh, this side here. Okay. Uh, so let me mention some caveats. And one is a, bit, a very important one. Uh, for example, for standard model, uh, uh, most of the standard model uh, things which people might be interested in uh, for I, most uh, are dimension six operators. So, so what are I dimension? Oops, in in the standard model, well, basically we have uh, well there are some dimension five operators that are uh, basically phi psi square, also called the Weinberg term, which are neutrino masses. If you use the Higgs and, and, and fermion, well, basically uh, yeah, Higgs and, and let and doublet square, gives you something dimension five and gives uh, dimension five. And then the next things are like dimension six. You have some things like, for example, H dagger, then UH, well, there's a whole list of dimension six operators. I'm not going to list the uh, whoa, 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 list with field strength and stuff. 
But the important thing that you see is that uh, this exists in the standard model, the set of dimension six operators. And the issue is that uh, all of these operators are of spin one and they are not probed by dispersion relations. So, so these have spin one, meaning that if you study the partial waves, the maximal spin in some channel is one, or not probe. by spin two, remember we explained that only this pressure relation with spin two or higher, oh sorry, spin greater than one, spin, uh, spin greater than one dispersion relations. But this is also a quick comment. Spin greater than one is not the same as spin greater than or equal to two, because if you have fermions, you can have uh, some rules with spin three half. But, uh, then this would be convergent by the arguments of, uh, yesterday. But uh, just more concretely, what is this uh, spin one sum rule is uh, what would be, uh, what is this? So, so if you have if you have a complex scalar, you can have a process like this, where uh, the arrows uh, go like this, and let's see, this is one, two, three, four. The amplitude has to be symmetrical in uh, in one and two. So, so you have an amplitude that can go like S. And and S is uh, yeah, not S square. The thing we can trigger on are things which grow like S square or faster. And so we just don't probe these things. So so when I say that when I say that causality implies EFT like power counting, it's only for operators which grow like S square or more. Okay, only for operators with spin two or higher. That's a long answer to a Lugas question. Uh, another comment is that that I will make is that uh, even if we uh, assume a convergence for j equal one, maybe there are some reason we should assume it. Even if we assume convergence for J equal one. Some rules, they will not be positive. They will not be. It's not really obvious to to. They will not be obviously positive. And it's very easy to see why because it's uh well it's basically odd on the crossing. So odd spin sum rule is something like ds over s square, and this amplitude. And and what this will give is, we'll, for example, let's call this uh, coefficient g1. If something like g1 is equal to an average in one channel, we have phi phi. Minus an average in the minus couplings in the phi phi bar channel, then over uh, gram square. Yeah. So, so it's always a difference of one channel minus another channel. That that's unavoidable because spin one is is odd on the crossing. Right. Rotation by 180 degree you get minus one. So. So yeah, so it's an open question what to say about, uh, it's a bit annoying because these are the thing, not annoying, but frustrating because these, these are clearly the things that people care most about, the dimension six operators, like experimentally. And and for all the story I've told you uh, so far, we see literally nothing about this. Uh, something else I should mention is that uh, some other caveat or maybe uh, things to extend is that, uh, like we have unitarity is more like unitarity tells us that the uh, imaginary part of partial wave is positive, but also bounded above.
right? It's two-sided. So we have just used one. Uh, using the other, presumably, we can get some strong coupling upper bounds. Uh, there's been some nice progress recently. Uh, well, there actually are various different ways to do this. There have been progress recently uh, this week, for example, uh, the uh, the group from uh, from Taiwan gave uh, uh, explained how to use this in uh, using mathematics of a moment problems. That's uh, very interesting. Uh, there's also, in fact, even more is true. Uh, the, the statement that S S matrix should be uh, less than one. This is a simple uh, statement. The statement that one plus I a L is less than one. This statement you can write in terms of a positive matrix. That's something that's discussed in the paper by Gehi and, and uh, Sever and other papers. Uh, you can write it as sequence of following matrix being positive, basically, sorry. You make a matrix that's the imaginary part, two minus the imaginary part, and then you put the real part of the diagonal. And you impose that this matrix is positive. So if it's positive, the diagonal has to be positive, but also the determinant has to be positive, and that gives this condition. So so more is true, and there's some understanding of how to use it, but I think it's not been explored uh, to its full power yet. So this is uh, something, uh, something like that, that, that's important. Uh, I could go on and talk about all the problems, but <laughs> and say I have limited time. Maybe I should talk about something that... <laughs> It kind of work and this uh, maybe also perhaps a, a surprising result that is uh, 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 related to a paper that uh, we put out this week, uh, me and, uh, and collaborators, the David Simon Stuffin, Yu Julie, and Julio Para Martinez. Uh, so let me spend basically most of my time left. Uh, discussing uh, EFTs of gravity. It turns out that they are qualitatively different from EFTs without. Any question at this point? Uh, Simon, maybe I can ask a question. Uh, if you use this nonlinear unitarity condition that you just mentioned, do you expect uh, that these two sided bounds would become stronger? Uh, it depends what regime one is in. Uh, uh, but perhaps this is uh, perhaps this will make this approach applicable to. Uh, other theory. So, so one one thing that happens, uh, maybe, maybe one thing I can say is that uh, uh, in 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 a lot of these bounds, you cannot exclude uh, the origin. So, so you, and in some sense, it would be a bit surprising. And phys physically, if you have a, uh, let me let me make it concrete. So, if you have a if you measure this thing here, okay, uh, and you know that uh, the mass has to be above something, if you don't impose the upper bound, the unitary upper bound, you could push the mass of the AV stuff to infinity, and then all the other couplings go to zero. But this unitarity limit prevents you from pushing the, uh, the mass of the stuff to infinity because the couplings cannot be larger than one. Mm -hmm. so, so there's a limit to how far, how far you push. So what you will gain from that are lower bounds on these other couplings. So if you measure if you measure the leading one, you cannot set the others to zero. Mm -hmm. So th there is definitely information, uh, but it, it's very nonlinear. It, it scales very nonlinearly with the size of the coupling because it's the size of G two which tells you how high you can push the uh, the mass. Okay. So that that that's one thing which 
maybe is relevant for some actual effective theories we care about, um, or maybe not. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. It's any, yeah. Any other questions? Any quick question? Other quick question? Nope. Yeah, maybe yeah. I can ask one question. Uh, yeah. So you showed this uh, two theories, right? One is obviously a uh, quantum field theory. Mm -hmm. The other one um, was not clear. Does it satisfy the unitarity bomb? Uh, oh. Ah, good point. Uh, well, well, none, none of them satisfy unitary bound because unitary bound is that uh, the, the imaginary part should be uh, less than one point wise. And here we have the imaginary part equal to a delta function. However, you can uh, take these theories and replace the pole by resonance by averaging over M. And then they both satisfy the unitary bound. I see. So, so yeah, so, so, so they are epsilon away from same theories. As far as so does that go. mean that you cannot uh, improve the bound any further by using unitarity? Yeah, this, uh, it seems that, uh, yeah, uh, I think it's it's really going to a different direction, but yeah, these two cusps, I don't see how we get rid of them unless we do something very uh, new. But right. uh, yeah, but but as I said, the the other kind of bounds we could get they scale a bit non-linearly with the uh, they're not like linear bounds like this, so they they, they matter when the mass of the cutoff and they uh, becomes closer to the. Uh, yeah, it's hard to think about the other bounds in this uh, in this plot because they're, they're, they're excluding region close to the origin. Okay. okay, thank you. There's a question in the chat box. Yeah, how do I take linear combination of theories? Yes, uh, uh, I just take linear combination of these S matrices, sorry. <laughs> yeah, in Lagrangian description, it doesn't make any sense. But uh, in terms of uh, being agnostic about the UV physics, you can declare that the UV S matrix is a linear combination of these S matrices. <laughs> as far as we look at 2 to 2, it makes sense. Maybe if you look at 2 to 3 in our process, it stops to make sense to like do this linear combination of theory thing. Because, uh, but, uh, but yeah, that's what I meant. OK, let me describe what is special about uh, gravity. And OK, I, uh, when I first, uh, when we first started looking at this, we studied theories of a scalar coupled to gravity and exchanging gravitons. And, and I could tell you about that, but it turns out that <laughs> gravitons themselves are much easier to study. <laughs> so <laughs> I just studied gravitons. <laughs> so. So, so to be clear, we'd be studying. Uh, we're assuming uh, we'd be assuming massless spin two particles. Let me just set set it up a little, little bit. Spin two particles. We assume Lorentz invariance, and we assume uh, causality in the form of analytic properties and, and blah blah blah. Okay, that these are basically our assumptions. Uh, the scattering amplitude. For graviton, if we do it in d equal four, we they're labeled by helicity. And, and there's this nice choice of helicity that I also discuss uh, in this lecture with amplitude as some factor of Square times some function of st. Okay, and this function of st, let me write it in full. It's basically eight pi g over stu from tree level exchange, and then there's a bunch of correction. In fact, there are corrections from the vertex. From the vertex, so this is uh, this is Einstein gravity. You can also there's a cubic term that you can add on the vertex, and then you'll get some uh, eight by g, some something I call g three square, and I forgot what it is, but probably uh, it's only a t channel pole, and then probably something like this, and then there's a bunch of contact interactions you can write down, 
something like I'm gonna write it as G4. Let's start that up. T, I'm gonna write it like, maybe it's, you're not familiar with all these scales physically, so I will write all these scales for like Lagrangian of gravity in a second. The, let me explain what is special about gravity from the viewpoint of dispersive sum rule. The phenomenon is, okay, I'm gonna run out of space. Let me take time to do it properly. Start afresh. So the important phenomenon is superconvergence. This function here in the bracket, let's call it F, uh, FST, the word bracket, satisfies the anti-subtractive dispersion relation. So you have something like at fix u, integral F, S, uh, and then uh, v squared minus S. Uh, ds s equals zero. That thing at low energy, so that's a, that's the that's a b two sum rule for this thing. That's a spin two sum rule, and then and that spin two, despite the fact that it's anti subtracted because of this factor here that has huge energy growth in front. So this sum rule looks as follows. So our sum rules are always balance low energy against high energy. And the point is that because we don't have any pole in this sum rule, this automatically kills all contacts. So this only probes the graviton exchange. So on the left-hand side, we basically have just eight pi g over p square plus the other thing turns out to have uh, just uh, if by g, g3 square, I think it's, I forgot the power of p. It's probably by dimension analysis, it's probably, is it p6? That sounds almost wrong, but uh, that's probably what it should be. Anyway, the point is that there's just two terms on the right hand side. So this is exact. And on the right hand side, we have some uh, basically uh, some over spin, uh, integral over m square. And then we have some basically legend, uh, sorry, Ringer function. So some spherical harmonic things times on unknowns that are positive. There's actually two different channels. There's a, uh, uh, yeah, this, this uh, basically coefficient in the plus plus same elastic channel and, and coefficient in the opposite, opposite elastic channel, but they're both square and they both appear with plus sign. So what is this is good for? Well, once you have a sum rule like this, that has finite things, finite number of things on the left and something on the right here, you can play this game and try to find combinations. Basically, try to try to try to find a wave function psi of p, such that the right hand side is positive. Let's find a positive function though. So this is B2 of, of P square. It is uh, yeah, integral zero to M, BP, some wave function psi of P, B2 of P. This so to P square. So that the right hand side is positive. It's positive and also it turns out you can find such functional such that the left hand side just measure gravity. Is 8 pi g divided by, well, 8 pi g times some constant. If 
if you can find such a functional, then, well, this functional proves that gravity is positive. Let's call this, let's call this functional psi magic. Gonna be, you see it's magical. Then, well, what this does is it proves that gravity is attractive, right? Because we equate on the left-hand side with gravity equals some positive sum. That doesn't sound very impressive. But the point is that to measure all these other couplings like G4, we can measure them by some rules which decay faster at high energies. So once you have psi magic, it's guaranteed that there exist functionals that are guaranteed that G minus, for example, some multiple of G4 is equal to psi magic minus some psi G4 is positive. So once you have a positive functional which measure gravity, you can bound all of the error derivative corrections by this leading relevant interaction. So that's the thing that's very special for gravity. You think of this thing as very relevant interaction, but it's not killed by some rules. So it normalizes everything else. So we get bounds of the following type. We get bound of G4. It's less than eight by G divided by some power here. It's fixed by analysis and you get a number here. Uh, let me make uh, uh, a technical statement in D equal four. Uh, in D equal four, there's a bit of a glitch, not a glitch, but there's an interesting issue about infrared. Uh, it turns out that uh, effectively the sort of function, okay, let me say it uh, in order. In D equal four, what happens if you insist that this functional psi is positive? That means if the action is positive, that means it's a, it's a four transform of a positive function. And that means it cannot vanish at P equals zero. And that means you get a log divergence yeah. at, on, on gravity. There's no, there's no way to avoid that. So let me say it in four. So if positive at all B, can't vanish at P equal zero. So it has to be log IR divergent on graviton pole. So that's just something we accepted and, and live with. So all of our bounds, they have in four dimensions, they have some extra log of the cutoff divided by some infrared scale. Simon, can I ask a question? Uh, so when you parameterize the G3 square term, yes. so just above, uh, a bit above your slide. Yes. Uh, why did you choose it to be G3 square and not leave it arbitrary and then let the dispersion relation decide on the sign of G3, G3 square? Uh, Yeah, here we're putting some information from the infrared because we know it's a square of something from the infrared theory. It mm -hmm. turns out that, and, 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 and you know that when you know something from the infrared, it gives you constraints on the UV, on the couplings to the UV. So, so by putting in information that this is positive, you actually get stronger bounds. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, so can you just remind me? We know it's positive, so we're allowed to. Uh -huh. What term in the Lagrangian gives rise to this? Uh, yeah, yeah. So let me write Lagrangian. That that's true. So that 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 that's you informing for interpretation. I have not seen the uh, Shea's lectures yet, but I suspect he discussed related things. But the interpretation is the following. So right, let's write down Lagrangian. 
with uh, keeping all, all units. So, right. so the user and Shang Hilbert would be that. Right. What I call G3 is normalized so that it's a uh, Riemann cube over three factor, okay? So G3 multiplied Riemann cube and without any factor of Planck or anything in front there. Okay? So when you look at the equation of motion, G3 is the thing that really measures the higher derivative terms. Oh, okay. And G4 also is normalized in a similar way. Um, oh, I think this, uh, I put a factor of Planck scale in this. Uh, sorry, yeah, for G4, we did it uh, differently. So uh, G4 over eight by G is the thing uh, that is here. And G4 over eight by G is the thing that we bound. Uh, yeah, there's something, so what, what does it show? So maybe let, let me let me make a, a plot just to make uh, this just to drive home this point. Just copy this plot towards the, the discussion. Uh, so so the vertical axis, yeah. So these are the things exactly normalized the same way. So G four units of m six divided by this. So there's some bound in terms of some order one coefficient, and that is this. Every time we have gravity, this is kind of a log and for a divergence in that. Okay, so all of these are gravitational couplings. And, okay, they- And MIR in your plot is some, uh, some, some scale. I mean, it's not some parameter. Yeah, some, no, exactly. It's some infrared scale that uh, is related to the infrared divergence. Physically, it's the, for example, when we play the same story in ADS, because we, we, we study last summer uh, bounds in ADS CFT. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when you, the exact same bounds apply in ADS and then this infrared scale just becomes the ADS radius. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it just, I think it's just some large scale beyond which you don't uh, care about positivity basically. So I am not very worried about it and, you know, I think, you know, to be conservative, you could take the radius of the universe and then log is still not so big. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, the biggest luck you can think of in physics is 100 or something. <laughs> but even if you, but you know, I actually think that this log in practice is more like a log of 10 because, uh, you know, I, I don't think this IR cutoff has to be parametrically much bigger than, than the mass M we're looking at. But okay. this is... This mm -hmm. is my viewpoint. Okay. But yeah, what does this bound? If you're in your, let's in your the log, because I don't think the, the important part is the power, not, not the log. The, mm -hmm. the, the power dependence on M Planck and on, on parameters is interesting because, uh, well, what, what is surprising is, is that these bounds are, these size of couplings is, uh, Mirror, so it's easiest to see in the S matrix. This is, I said that G4 has to be less than something times eight pi G. So this thing here, yeah, is, is less than eight pi G times some constant over M6. This is what you get if you exchange a heavy particle with gravitational strength coupling. So these bounds show that if you have two gravitons, they couple to heavy stuff, and, and here we have a graviton and, and, and graviton. The coupling air can't exceed the gravitational strength. So there has to be In other words, this thing here has to be square root of eight by G times uh, something order one. At the, at the mass uh, scale uh, M here. Yeah. So this non-perceptive rubber bound that partial waves are less, great, are less than one, does not play any role in gravity. Whatever gravitons couple to, they cannot couple strongly to anything. At, at energies here, I should emphasize that I'm looking at scenarios where you get 
new physics less than M Planck, like weakly coupling string, weakly coupled string theories, or any scenario where have new physics below the Planck scale. So below the Planck scale, the three graviton coupling is small, and and we saw that the couplings of two gravitons to anything else must be equally small. So this means that, let me put it differently, if, uh, if someone were to measure one of these coefficients in this form, so if someone measure this uh, coupling G3, then you can predict the mass of new physics. Okay? So, so G3 is unit of length the four. So if G3 of order R0 to the four is measured, then new, and we also show that the new, the new states must be higher spin state, not just like spin two calcer Klein modes or other things like this. They have to be higher spin state. Must exist at mass less than one over R zero. So let me emphasize this. So for example, if you see, if you were to measure a non, a non, I don't know how you would do that, but if you were to measure somehow an astro, uh, around the astrophysical black hole, astrophysical black hole of size 10 kilometer, a non-zero G3, you would need a particle, you know, if, uh, if, if you had something like, you know, 10 kilometer four, that would be a huge correction to GR, but that's the sort of correction we can look for in the sky. If you were to see that in the sky, you would have to deduce that there's a higher spin particle of mass less than you know, 10 to the minus 11 electron volt that exists. Okay. It's, a, it's a bound along these lines. And that basically means, it also means that if you were to measure this, ma this, uh, this coupling, you'll be so close to your EFT cutoff that you wouldn't be able to use EFT. <laughs> EFT is never valid to capture large corrections to GR. So it's very, effective field theories of GR are very special. You, uh, they break down as soon as it becomes far from GR. There's no such thing as an EFT of large modifications to GR that respect causality. So yeah, I can say more words along this line, but I think I, I'll stop here. This is, these are things that I hope should be, uh, would be inspiring to think about. So thank you, everyone. OK, Simon, thanks a lot for three wonderful lectures. Uh, so your, uh, your last uh, set of comments were very intriguing. So according to you, uh, uh, theories that people consider like F of R gravity, those are not sensible theories? Ah. Uh, F of R is exceptional because F of R is equivalent to R plus uh, a minimally coupled scalar plus some potential. It's equal. And so F of R is not, a, it's not actually, in our perspective, it's not actually a modification to gravity. It's just gravity plus some matter when mm -hmm. you just happen to choose a particular potential. And then the sort of question you can ask is you can ask, uh, is this potential allowed by swamp plan constraints and so on? And, and the, the, the status from our perspective of you know, S matrix unitarity and so on is that uh, this is uh, unconstrained by us. <laughs> I see. Some people may not like that this potential is very flat or it looks like mm -hmm. this flatness looks like a global symmetry or you know, the, the people have various things they don't like about this potential, but we say literally nothing about this. So for us, F of R is not a modification of gravity, mm -hmm. but things like uh, uh, Riemann cube or, or, and so on, what we're saying is that as soon as this term kicks in, okay, maybe I should also explain why I did not uh, look at uh, R square, R square is removable by equation of motion. So by field definition, like we discussed before. Mm -hmm. uh, Riemann square is, is a total derivative of equivalent to R square. So, so, so Riemann cube is really like the, 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 
the first thing that modifies the graviton scattering amplitude. Yeah, in a theory of pure gravity, but if, if there is a dilaton coupling to R square, you cannot redefine it away. Yeah, no, but then then we the way we think about this is that this is a coupling between the scalar. Uh, this is a non-minimal coupling between scalar and gravity. This is actually an important open open uh, direction to go. We like we study scattering of gravitons, and now we want to study scattering of graviton with matter to constrain the the non-minimal right. couplings. So, but that's the way we think about this. If you have a Riemann square times phi, we don't think of it as a modification of gravity. We think of it as some non-minimal coupling to matter. Okay. Because that that that's the it's it, it's only it's only visible in scattering processes that involve matter and gravitons. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is a question about this is analysis also rule out Gauss Bonnet terms. Uh, I believe this analysis, uh, it's clear from this kind of argument. Uh, so in our dimension, you can find this magic functional. So it's clear that you get two sided bounds on uh, the gauss bonnet term in 5D, for example. In 4D, there's no such thing as gauss bonnet term, so we don't uh, we don't say anything about it. But in 5D, yes, it does not rule it out, but it gives you two-sided bounds on its coefficients. We'll give. We don't have those yet. There's another question in the chat box. Ah, interesting question. Yeah, in this lecture we consider about four point. Yeah, I, I focus on four point because. I don't know uh, yet how to use IR points for bootstrap. Any people, some people are thinking about this. Uh, uh, I'm sure there is, uh, I'm sure there will be things that are interesting to do with this. I cannot, uh, cannot make sweeping statements. Uh, but yeah, what, I mean, what do IR points probe? They probe uh, gravitational radiation, and then you can probe corrections to gravitational radiation. And in some sense, this is these are the sort of things we see uh, in uh, black hole experiments and you know, in, in LIGO and things like this. So, so, so this interesting physics in higher point amplitudes. So, so we've got to learn something from them, but uh, that's all I can say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, more questions? We still have quite a bit of time, so feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions. Oh, or maybe uh, let me let me. This is one thing I, I forgot to to say. Uh, with gravity, there's two kind of problems we can look at. Uh, what effective theory of gravity? We can ask how close to GR can it be. I can ask how far from GR can it be? I discussed just one of those questions here. And how far? Okay. The, this is this how far here. This is the problem we've, we've, uh, we've done. We try to maximize uh, G4 given uh, mass m of higher, new higher spin states. Thing like string modes and so on, but we don't put in that they are string modes. Uh, our close to GR is the problem of showing that, uh, can you put things to zero? <laughs> you know, can you have, could you have exactly GR at low energies and no correction? Or do we need like Planck scale effects? Like, do we need? I suppose there's no, there's no, there's no new string state, new air spin scale, like nothing. A, a great desert up to the Planck scale. Like, what is the minimum effect that you have to see because something interesting happens at the Planck scale? And and this problem. Actually, has been uh, interesting progress on this problem uh, in the uh, in in the 10D supersymmetric case. In the 10D supersymmetric case, there's a beautiful paper called Weyer string theory. Uh, 
by Guerrieri, uh, Penedanes, and, and Vieira, they show that uh, yeah, they show that uh, oops, stuck. They show that uh, the theory which is closest to to GR happens to be uh, a string theory meaning that it has the value of the coupling that's exactly the, as predicted by a string theory moduli space. So that, that's kind of a neat result. So there are this progress on both of these fronts. And there's also some, I should also mention some, some kind of technical aspects of this. A, we use a dual bootstrap. A, we use the primal. They, they use the primal, meaning that they generated this matrices, which uh, are the closest to, to gravity. Uh, they don't know how to do the uh, dual problem yet, and we don't know how to do the primal problem on our side. So for both questions, there should be two approach which converge. Don't have that yet. The string theory that's somewhere along the moduli space of uh, type 2b theory or type 2a, I forgot. They're, 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 both of them are, there's a special point in the moduli space that they have minimal value. Is it is the question, is it feasible that there are models that are exactly solvable by such a Smith-Fix bootstrap? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, yeah. Uh, we can do some exploration. So the the actually this there's, there's a I have a plot here which does not really answer this question, but partly. Uh, so this is some allowed region on some higher derivative coupling. Uh, the question that, that's asked here are there some models which should maximize those and 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 yeah, string theory is somewhere in the middle. It's not that far from the edge, but it's not at the edge. So if it were at the edge, you could hope to immediately say something about string theory from, from these methods. Or if, if, if theory shows up at the cusp, you can extract the spectrum at the cusp, the unique spectrum which realizes theory. Uh, so we can probably say things about this theory, but I don't know what this theory is, or if it's interesting, or, or maybe I don't even know if these bounds are optimal. Maybe there's some... Uh, uh, but these are 4D bounds, so so it's hard for them to be optimal because there are logs everywhere. Not on this plot, but on most plots there are logs. Uh, I think I think this question is it feasible that our models are exactly solvable? I think that's the dream of everyone, but so far we haven't found such model. I mean, they are example in 2D, but then that's it. Yeah. There's no at the moment. There's no higher dimensional S matrix where. From two to two scattering alone, we isolate an interesting physical theory. Okay, any other questions? We still have a minute left. Mm -hmm. Yeah, except uh, actually, except for this one by, uh, except for this particular point in the moduli space of string theory. Mm -hmm. So it's worth pushing there. That's, Soon as at least we have one data point. Okay, so I don't see any raised hand or any further questions in the chat box. So, so let's uh, thank uh, Simon again for three wonderful uh, lectures, which no doubt will be very useful for all the students here. And uh, we will reconvene at 11 a.m. again uh, to uh, listen to Shiraz. So, okay, thank you very much, uh, Simon. And we uh, hope to see you in better times. Yes. <laughs> yeah. thank, thank you, everyone. It was fun. <laughs> Bye-bye. Yeah, Thanks you had a lot. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thanks.